through the arterials of contrition, which resulted from the sting of our sin. Grant us, O Lord God, that we may meet you with purity and an enlightened soul, and delight in the eternal blessings of your kingdom. And we will glorify you together with the lambs on your right and give glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my sins. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sins. Satisfy me with your joy and gladness, that my broken spirit may rejoice. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your spirit of holiness from me. O Lord, open my lips, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you desire not sacrifice, you deny not in birth offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The praise, glory, and honor of the Lord of the Trinity. Down to sing sense. Carry a wish sign. Can you find that one, please? <clears throat> May we offer glory, praise, and honor to the sea of mercy and compassion, the ever flowing spring of blessings, and to the one who promised the heavenly kingdom for those who work in the vineyard of justice and of truth. To Christ the good one, our due glory and honor on this day and all the days of our lives, now and forever. O oh, immortal one, through your death you gave life to our race. Send down your love toward our feeble supplication. O oh, Son of God, you will to give us life, and you died for our sake. Hear the petitions which we bring now before you. O oh, abundant treasury, from which all oh, our needy we may receive, grant our request which we ask of you. Accept the incense which we offer before your majesty, and by it may the richness of your fragrant mercies rest upon us. O Lord, look upon us, your worshippers, standing before you with souls in agony and in bodies in affliction. 
Nothing can help and nothing can save except your mercy. And none can heal and none can give life except your love. As we have borne your seal since the waters of our baptism, have believed in your holy name, and have consumed your body and drank your blood, let your living cross be a rudder for our ship and guide us through the storms which surround us. Shine your salvific mercy upon us, and by your grace let there be rest to our affliction. Let your mercy bring comfort to us as we bow before you. Forgive our sins and blot out all our offenses from your book. When the thread of our lives comes to an end, send to us, O Lord, an angel of peace in your providence. Let the watcher of your mercy kindly guide our souls away from the guards and the attacks of the devil, that we may be delivered by you. Sprinkle upon us the dew of your mercy, and with your aid and together with the legions of the children of light, we shall sing glory when you arise to carry out judgment upon all the generations. In your mercy, O Lord, make us worthy to stand at your right hand. Together we shall all sing glory to your divinity and give thanks in a clear voice to you, the Hidden One. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, to you be glory and your may your mercy be upon us forever. Amen. O Christ, medicine of truth, you humble yourself toward earthly things and heal the suffering and the of our other Exalted one, in your mercy you came down among earthly beings. O you who are forgiving and holy, in the abundance of your grace forgive now our iniquities. In your love accept our sincere petition. Be pleased by the sweet fragrance of our incense which we now offer before your majesty. And through it send down tranquility and peace upon the entire world. O Lord, our God, to you be glory now and forever. The mercy.
merciful physician came to bind up those who suffer. He gave health to all who are afflicted and healing to all who are sick. Almighty God, forever, by the wounds and sufferings which you bore, you healed the wounds of our weak human race, and you forgave our sins and follies. from James, the Apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ, before this sacred lamp and before the Father, our priest. Glory to the Lord and the Apostles. May their prayer be a wall of protection for this city and for all who dwell in it forever. Is any one of you Suffering? Let him pray. Is any cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with the oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick man and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous man has great power in its effects. Elijah was a man of like nature. With ourselves he prayed fervently that it might not rain and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth its fruit. Praise be to God always. For the proclamation of the gospel of our the gospel of our life and salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Excuse me. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer you incense and ask for your forgiveness. Let us be attentive to the gospel of life and salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ, as recorded by the evangelist Luke. Behold, a lawyer came forward to test Jesus by asking, Rabbi, what must I do to gain eternal life? And Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, 
and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus then said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you shall live. But because the man wished to justify himself, he asked, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. And they stripped him, and they beat him, and then went off, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be traveling along that same road, but when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. A Levite, likewise, came to that spot and saw him, but he too passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was traveling along that road came upon him, and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. He went up to him, and he bandaged his wounds after having poured oil and wine upon them. Then he brought him upon his own animal to an inn and looked after him. The next day, he took out two denarii, and he gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Look after him, and when I return, I shall repay you for every, anything more you might spend. Now which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And he answered, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the truth, peace be with you. Praise, thanksgiving, and blessings to Jesus Christ for giving us his words of life and to his Father who sent him to redeem us and to his living spirit now and forever. Go and do likewise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Now, we can ask the question, what does it mean to be healed? And when we talk about original sin, we speak about being wounded. Well, clearly we're not all limping around this world. And even the most healthy individual, we will still say, is wounded by original sin. To some extent, it has to do with our inclinations, it has to do with some of our disordered emotions. But the much more profound sense of original sin is the loss of grace, the loss of intimacy with God in which the human race was created, in which, in fact, all of creation was created in grace. You have it in the anaphora of St. John Maron. So when we speak about the question of being wounded, the essence of original sin is the loss of grace, the loss of that intimacy. But there are also positive wounds that come down upon us because of the act of violence that Adam and Eve exercised upon human nature in making those decisions. And that violence reverberates down like so many other bad decisions of parents have reverberated down through the generations and the centuries. We are the children of our parents for better and for worse. We receive benefits and we are also limp longer into the next generation by choices they make. So, when we speak about wounded, we have to realize that there is both the order of nature and the order of grace of the human beings that function in this world. And that while the essence of, the essence of original sin is the loss of grace, that's why it has to be given to us by revelation. This is not a logical thing. Some people think that by looking around the world and, and, and innocent children die, that this is an effect and therefore proof of original sin, but it's not a proof. Because original sin in its essence is the loss of grace. And grace is not something we can see or touch. It's part of revelation. Because it's God's extension and God's life to us. And God's invitation to us. 
So what St. Thomas does is in this, he compares human nature. He talks about happiness in this world, and then he uses the world for the happiness in the presence of God of beatitude. The, the terms in Latin are felicitas, felicity, and beatitudo. And what he says is that in this world, there is happiness, and there's true happiness. It's not like everything is miserable. There is true happiness, but true happiness, true in the sense that for that moment that we have it for a time, that contentedness before these things ephemerally just pass away. So he says there is a happiness in the world, and it is a participation, a reflection of the divine happiness, which is God himself. But just because it's a participation, it is a reflection of, it's a reflection of the beatitude for which we are created. So even in its best state, without grace, life will always have an aspect of woundedness because it will always lack grace. But the grace that's given to us both heals our lower natures, restores and prepares for us the day of the resurrection. This is why when we do this anointing, and we've mentioned to you last year that this ceremony is considered actually to be the old the oldest formula that we had for our sacrament of extreme unction. The seven lamps, the seven candles, and normally there's the seven gospels and seven epistles, and you'd have also, they, they want to have seven priests there. I don't know when that ever actually happened, but those are in the rubrics. And the idea of the seven is the fullness of the restoration. So when we speak about this world, there is a woundedness to us because of its absence of grace, but it doesn't mean that it's bad. It just means that it's wounded. It's not what it is meant to have been originally. And so what grace does to us is heal and strengthen our nature, our lower nature, our emotions, our passions. Notice a number of times we ask for the forgiveness of our sins at the beginning of this liturgy and for God's peace and his mercy to descend upon us. Peace and mercy, compassion, these are things that bring together a healing so that our lives become a preparation for the resurrection. And the resurrection is nothing but a result of what the healing grace takes place before us. So while we speak about the felicity or the happiness in this world being a participation in the divine happiness, it is radically distinct as far as God is distinct and infinitely transcendent from this world. But God is also imminent to this world, sustaining things and bringing forth life and continuing, and continuing all things in existence. This is the real notion of healing all around completely, the shlomo, the fullness of healing. It's not something that we receive later on, it's a process that begins already here below. And that's why Notice this, the prayers and the hymns as we go through these texts and the lighting of the seven candles before the anointing takes place. In order to understand that what we're doing here is this kind of capping of all of this great length of the fast over these six and a half weeks now, in the seventh week, and to find this healing of grace in order that not just simply that we find peace by the hand of the Sacred Heart, but that we also be prepared for the day of the resurrection and to the beatitude for which we were created. This is why even your best pagan, it's debated among theologians, can there be perfect virtue without grace? St. Thomas and those say no. But even in the best understanding of nature, even if you could take for the sake of the argument of the perfect pagan without grace of virtue, it would still be wounded because it still would not be touched by the reality for which it was created, which is the intimacy and the vision of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That reality will always be until we find and reach out and receive that invitation from the hidden one, we will still always be wounded because grace will be absent. And that's why when grace begins to work in the soul of an individual, it makes them discontented, unhappy not at ease in this world, because it's meant to be weaning them off of the things of the world so they do not remain attached. The things in this world may be good, but they're not the things that we were created for. And that's why when grace starts working within souls, it really starts making us not agitated, not upset, not depressed, but unsatisfied. It's just not, there's something missing here. 
And there are souls who will wander for years, sometimes even decades, before they find. You just have to read the Confessions of St. Augustine. And he analyzes those first 30 years of his life, running after this and running after that and running after it. And you see, as grace begins to work in them, everything just becomes insipid. And so they'll celebrate, they'll do the things they have to do in this world, but none of them are the satisfaction because even though they may be real sources of happiness, a real reflection of the eternal one, grace is echoing within their spirits to say, but it's not that. And St. Augustine uses the image that I ran after all of these things trying to find love, which was impossible because they were only reflections of the infinite love, which is God. And so that's why when grace starts working within the soul, it always begins to make us see and not understand these things, that they're no longer satisfying. And that is why when you find that people have been transformed by grace, their desire for death is not for escape, but just I've had enough, we're done. I've spent enough time. You know, when you think about, put it in human terminology, like an analogy, right? Think of your teenage years. Let's go to the mall. Ooh, it's exciting. We'll go to this store, and we'll go to that store, and we look at these things, and we look at this. Now we surf the web. I think it was a bit more fun with the soft pretzel running up and down escalators instead of just sitting in the den, you know, scrolling. But it comes a point when it's like, all right, it's four o'clock, I, I gotta, we gotta, let's go go out or something. We go to something else. So it doesn't matter how many things surround us and how enticing they are in the beginning. In the end, they're still done. Everyone enjoys taking their rest and sleeping. But when you're ill and you're in the bed for 24 hours a day for days on end, the bed becomes a torment. That is the working of grace. There are things of beauty and goodness in the world, but when grace works that comes from the infinite good one, then we begin to see that these things are empty. And this is why in all of the blessed deaths that I have seen over 30 years, they all come to the point, not because they're in pain, but because everything is just vacuous. It's empty. It's time for, I'm ready to go. And again, not because they're escaping, it's because they have been over years, grace transforming them, turned towards it, towards the vision of divinity, that they're ready to leave, not because they're escaping here, but because they're totally oriented by grace towards the hidden face of the Father. That is a beautiful thing. That is the full understanding of healing. That's the full meaning between, uh, behind the liturgy that we celebrate this evening. So may the Lord God, may the Sacred Heart touch us and make everything vacuous and to be seen for what it is as being insipid. And insipid literally in Latin means without taste or flavor. It's just flat. And transforming our spirits bring us the full healness, full, the full healing that comes only by the fullness of grace and the desire to see God face to face at his invitation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So we will now continue on with the litanies and the beginning to light the lamp. Again and again, let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord.
ise O good shepherd, you came to seek the lost sheep. Call us now, O Lord, that we may be sheep of your flock. O good Lord, open your door to us sinners. Open to us the door of your mercy, that we may come to you. With the sign of your cross, mark, O Lord, all the members of our body, and protect them from all harm. Do not let evil and its inclinations dominate at will. Our eyes, that they may look to you in purity. Our ears, that they may be inclined to listen to your word. Our lips, that they may sing the glory of your name. Our breath, that it may breathe the fragrance of eternal life our hands that they may keep knocking at your door, and our feet that they may walk upon the path leading to the temple of your divinity. Our soul then, O Lord, will be able with our five senses to raise glory to your holiness. From the treasury of your kindness, Grant pardon to all the sins we have committed with the senses of our body and soul.
Christ the King. May your blessing be upon sinners and all of you. Open your door to the humble who petition you. May Mary, the Virgin who gave birth to you, intercede with you on our behalf. May the martyrs who gave their lives in your home join us to implore you. In your mercy, O Lord, reconcile us to you.
forgiveness of your sins and faults and to the kingdom of your God on this day. Join me on the bottom of page 27. My soul is broken and afflicted. My soul yearns for mercy. Come to me, Lord, tell me to rise and serve like the woman with fever who received your blessing. Heal my soul, O Lord, and grant me blessing that comes from you. You cured the sick, O Lord, only by the touch of your hand. Now touch my soul, O Lord, heal my infirmity, and forgive my sins. You are love, tender and healing love. Tell me, O Lord, to rise and serve, that I may rise and serve. My soul sings to the one who healed us from our ills, who granted us total cure from our sickness. My soul sings to the Son, our Savior and Physician, our Healer and our All-Merciful One. My soul sings to the Father and to the Holy Spirit for ages to come. Please stand. Kyrie eleison, Kyrie Oh, oh, oh. 
of our souls and bodies. In your grace and in your bounty of the Father who sent you, heal our infirmity and our ills. May your mercy and compassion be upon us, your creatures and the work of your hand so that we may find salvation in you and offer glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and for. 